praise the Lord. And welcome to yet another edition in our continuing series on the essentials, the basics of our faith, the Christian foundation. To introduce our subject today, let us read from Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. chapter 7 from verse number 1 then said the high priest are these things so and he said men brethren and fathers hearken the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haram, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldees, and dwelt in Haram. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein he now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him when as yet he had no child. When as yet he had no child. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him when as yet he had no child. There is something about walking with God which we will need to be clear about and the sooner the better especially for somebody who is just starting so you understand from the beginning which is why we have to deal with it as part of the Christian foundations so we understand it from the beginning so that moving forward it becomes, permit me to use the word, the culture. It becomes our way. Virtually every person that God used in the Bible had to experience something or the other of this, this particular matter. He says here, God says to Abraham, come out from your country, come out from among your people, come out from your father's house to a land that I will show you. And then the man gets to the land and he says to him, 
This is it. But then the Bible says in Acts chapter 7, verse 5 now, he did not even as much as, he said, it says, and he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him. How are you going to give it to him and he doesn't set his foot on it? So how is he going to possess it? This is the reason you ask the man to leave his country, leave his father's house, leave his, his people, and then he gets to the place, and you tell him, this is it, but you don't let him possess it. He doesn't set, it's written there, he doesn't set his foot on it. And you are promising that you give it to him, and to receive after him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we see a statement that says, the wisdom of God is foolishness to men. He didn't say to unbeliever men. He says to men, human beings. The wisdom of God is foolishness. So if you are going to walk with God successfully for that matter, There's going to be a lot of foolishness. There's going to be a lot of foolishness about you. By that I mean people looking at you and even you will feel foolish until the fruit of your so-called foolishness springs forth. <coughs> that is, until the result of your obedience becomes clear. The wisdom of God is foolishness to men. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Verse 19, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. 21, For after that in the wisdom of God the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Now, that is the wisdom of God in action. But I think it's in chapter 3 where he expressly says the wisdom of God is foolishness to men. He says to the Greek, they seek, um, they seek a sign. But to the Jews, they seek wisdom, something like that. So I said, it will be great to establish as early as possible this simple fact, God's way is not man's way. That is how scripture puts it. Eh? Isaiah 55, 6 and 7, God's way is not man's way. So if you are thinking that you can use your brain to understand God's way, you will be frustrated and you are going to give up because it will not make sense since you are trying to appropriate it by your brain. It will not make sense. It cannot make sense. It is simply received by faith. If this is all we say, well, we can dismiss. Really. Whatever else that is said today will just be explanation. Walking with God is fraught with plenty of foolishness. That is, seeming foolishness. 
we walk with God by faith, not by sight. I think that's Second Corinthians five uh, seven or so. For we walk by faith, not by sight. The reason it looks foolish to the man operating by his brain is because the man operating by his brain wants to see what he can understand. He wants to hear what he can understand. He wants to see something to believe. The man of faith, the Christian, forget man of faith, the Christian, because if I say man of faith, you think that the person I'm talking about has matured to the level of man of faith. No, no, forget that one. The Christian, the born-again person, believes to see. The unbeliever wants to see before he will believe. I've said that again. The Christian believes to see. The unbeliever wants to see to believe. The man of his brain, the man who walks by his brain, wants to understand before he moves. Or he wants to see something which makes sense. So he's going to tell you that does not make sense, he does not add up. And so he's going to stay where he is and figure out something that his brain can understand or handle and he will go and do that one. But you see, such a person, yes, he's born again, but he will never produce the fruit of born againness insofar as he is operating by his brain. Because first of all, the, the lifeline, the life juice of the fruit of the kingdom is faith. So if you are not operating by faith, you cannot produce those fruit. For example, the fruit of the spirit represents evidence that the spirit of God is working in that life. Now, if the spirit of God is working in that life, He's going to do or say to you things on behalf of God the Father. The same God whose wisdom is foolishness to men. So when the Holy Spirit is dealing with you, he is still going to seem foolish. So how will you produce results from something you refuse to comply with because it seems foolish? So you can't, you cannot bear the fruit of the Spirit. There's no way. All right, let's take an example. Let's take um, let's take something like temperance. I was going to say quietness, but I understand quietness is not listed as one of the fruits. So let's take something like temperance. That's close enough to quietness. Temperance means to be even, even minded, even, even, e v e n, even. That is no shaking. It's just there. Calm, peaceful. If you like, let one trailer fall now and the forest starts to burn. The man is going to sit calmly and be watching. He knows that no weapon fashioned against me can prosper. He knows that already. So if the fire likes that he burn to an inch of his foot, he may sit down there and not run away. He knows that that thing cannot affect him. So he's just cool, calm, and collected. <coughs> so he's even tempered. You can't anger him to the point where he could shout for Mero. No way. You can't hear his voice that he's shouting to his children or to his wife. He's like, no way. Sometimes we describe such people as ice water. Dangerous people. I don't mean dangerous as they can kill. But well, some, yeah. Because you can't read them. Not from their face, not from their words. They're just cool. Now I say, it is really quietness I wanted to describe because temperance is already a fruit of the spirit. It's that, that's easy to understand. There are people who are born quiet. And they will fail with God without their natural quietness. But there are people who the Holy Spirit makes into quietness. They are not the same. The person who becomes quiet by the dealing of the Holy Spirit is doing it by faith. If you leave that man, make him tell you in mind, you will discover that he has a brain in his head. He can think. You will discover that for his mind, he is shouting at you. But what you will see from him 
he not talk anything. It's not that he not talk anything. He has heard the Holy Spirit telling him to shut up. Or he has heard the Holy Spirit telling him, don't say a word. Or the Holy Spirit may have even told him at home, you are going to go to office today and this is what is going to happen. Don't react. What you will see is a quiet man. His parents, his biological siblings who grew up with him at home, they know that that's not my brother. You can't do that with my brother, you will break your head. They know that. So what has happened to this guy? That's when they will say, ah, the man is, he has become a Christian. He has changed. That's because the Holy Spirit has produced a quiet person. Not a non-talking person, a quiet person inside. And since talking is an activity, a quiet person inside is not going to be inclined to talk. So it will leave you in your foolishness and you will think that you won. And then the thing will pile up and one day the basket of that judgment will fall on your head. From God, not him. See, what I'm saying now about quietness, I learned it in the presence of God. Not from book. Certainly not from the book called the Bible. No. You will go to God, you will stay there five hours, he won't say a word. And one day I realized what he was doing to me. He was infusing into me the ability to sit down for five hours and not talk. Not talk, not think anything. My brain will be going all over the place. I'll have to catch my brain, my thoughts, and drag them back to where I'm sitting down. Hey, behave yourself. I'm, I'm hoping that God will talk to me here. You are running all over the place. Sit down here. After a while, I got used to it. Unlike before, you talk one, I tell you five. Now, somebody who is watching and he sees that you have been provoked and you didn't react because of the quietness that has been manufactured inside you, he sees that you did not react, he's going to call you what? You don't turn to Momo. That is the foolishness of the wisdom of God in the matter of quietness. That's why we can't be part of those where they shout for men. It's written there about Jesus that a smoldering wax or reed, flax, he will not break. His voice will not be heard in the streets. So all those times multitudes were following him. Did they not hear his voice? But that's not what he's preaching. That's not what we're talking about. You cannot hear his voice that he's shouting with him and neighbor, Ibahu Gopak does me. That, that type of thing. You can't hear his voice. Instead, if we pack the thing, pay for it, enter inside his house quiet. The person who the Holy Spirit has dealt with over the years, you can't see him shouting, fighting, anywhere, not just in public, anywhere. The only time he's fighting is in prayer. Maybe he's attacking something in prayer. So back to what I was getting at. So God says to Abraham, come out of your father's house. Sorry, come out from your country. Come out from among your people. Come out from your father's house to a land that I will show you. Oga, how are we going to do this journey? At least if I'm going to, um, if I'm going to Enugu, if it's Enugu we are going to, at least you will tell me the bus that I will enter now, you will tell me to enter Arabi on a bus from Lagos, or if there's direct in Nubu, I don't know. You will tell me to enter whichever one, so that when I get there, then I can now enter in Nubu and go there. Uh, uh, so it doesn't make sense. How can you tell me to just pack my load, come out of me, and just, okay, this one involves country, no. So country, leaving your country means you are going to the airport. So you carry your bag and you go to the airport. Okay, where would they go? No answer. How can I leave my country if I don't have a destination. Which plane am I going to enter? Okay, you are going by land border. Which land? Is it Diroko or uh, Katsina side to go to Niger? Or uh, you pass uh, the Cameroon side? Which border am I going to pass? He didn't tell Abraham where they were going. Madness. What kind of journey is that? He didn't tell Abraham where they were going. He said, come, follow me. We are going somewhere. He is talking to a spirit. You can't even see the person talking to you. Madness. So when people come and ask Abraham, 
Or that way they go, who talk to you? Who is sent? Is it Michael Abu Gabriel Abu uh, uh, Turim Amurim? Who is sent to tell you this journey? Eh? They, they are, they are, what's the word? Um, they are laughing at you. Okay. Mocking. Uh -huh. They are mocking. What are you talking? Say God say you should pack, you should close down your business. Come off your back, close everything down and go on a journey. Okay, no problem. We hear you. God is there's nothing God cannot do. True. Where is it make you go? Uh, I don't know. It's make I go airport. Uh huh Now, to be honest with you, if I haven't done this myself, I will laugh at anybody who comes to tell me, God said, Come, let's be going. And you go to the airport. But he did it to me. One evening, I, was, I think I've told the story here before. I packed my small bag. I went to the airport. I said, I'm going to South Africa. No visa. No news or, or, or information about whether there's a South Africa flight that day. I was not interested. He said, go, I go. But those were the beginning. He's training in righteousness. He's training you in how to work with him without being certain in concrete terms of what you are about. We are, we'll soon get to that, we are in the business of the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is not a physical thing. It's not a physical, so if it's not a physical thing, it cannot be represented by physical things. So it, it cannot say, come and go to the kingdom of God. Then you ask him where. But he will use us to establish his kingdom in different parts of the world, in the hearts of men. So, number one, walking with God is fraught with foolishness because the person you are walking with, the wisdom by which he is operating is foolishness to men. That's number one. Number two, we walk by faith in this business of the kingdom. We walk by faith. Now, I'm listing these things. Now, if you don't understand, then it becomes your responsibility to try to understand. If you are going to understand by books or you are going to understand by revelation from the Holy Spirit, you have to find a way to understand. Otherwise, there will be frustration. It's fraught with foolishness. We walk by faith. Number three, it is not by sight. It is not based on what you see. It is not based on what you can see. So when God is going to, this is by when God is dealing with you on a particular subject, because your brain is used to, your brain is designed to operate on the basis of what can be understood physically. Now, when God is dealing with you, God is spirit. So he will be dealing with you from the spirit dimension, which is by faith, which is not by sight, because the spirit world is not by sight anyway. So when God is dealing with you and he's saying some things to you, your brain will be wondering how. Because your brain cannot see it. Your brain cannot imagine how it is possible or how it's going to be. That is where the faith comes in. Your own. Make sure God has spoken to you. Test the spirit. That is your own. Make sure. Once you have confirmed for yourself that what you are hearing is God, just go and do according to what you have heard. Forget about what your brain can understand or what your brain can see. If not, your brain is going to, what's the word, twat, frustrate. Your brain is going to frustrate that your obedience. Because you will get to a point and you will be tired of walking in the desert and there's no house in sight. Where we come they go then? And you won't realize that it is you he wants to use to build the house that you are using eye to look for. So I got to the Sahara Desert. 
And one morning, I'm sitting on top of a sand dune, a eh, very small hill, all sand, no stone, no rock, just sand, small hill. I'm sitting on top, just by myself, around 10 ish in the morning. I'm just Call it meditating if you like. I'm just idling, just sitting down there. And suddenly, I realized now what happened that day, but at that moment, I didn't realize what was going on. Suddenly, my hand, my finger, drew two curved lines on the ground, on the sand. Two curved lines. I don't know which kind of, am I a small child? Which kind of play with that? We play that kind of play for small kids. I drew two curved lines on the ground. Then, the same finger decided to draw another two curved lines on top of the first two lines. I looked at the thing. It didn't make sense. So I fashioned. So I said, Lord, uh, how far now? How I go be now? Every day I'm begging to eat. Every day I don't know what's going on. I'm looking at people. They're walking. They're eating. I'm just here. I'm just doing nothing. Just reading the Bible, talking with you. Is that what I came here to do? What's going on? And then he says, don't go forward. Don't go backwards. Don't go sideways. Stay here. I said, okay, what do you mean? At that moment, the lines I drew on the ground suddenly made sense. Because I looked at those lines and I realized I just drew an aeroplane. You see the two second lines across were supposed to be the wings of the aeroplane. The first two lines were the body of the aeroplane. And I understood in my heart, if you go go Saudi Arabia, it will be by plane. Calm down. This one, don't go anywhere. Stay here. So, okay, you brought me here, don't be sad they go. Why did you encourage me to leave home that I'm going to Saudi Arabia? He said, I brought you here to break you. Because the way you were in Lagos, I could not have used you like that. So I brought you here to break you. So don't go anywhere. Forget about going to Saudi. Stay here. This is really where I did go with you. Is that what you mean? He thank God no telephone that time, sir. Not that I'm happy that there was no telephone because there was somebody back at home hoping to hear from me. Nothing. No telephone, no postmaster, nothing. So, but wait, the next one I go write, come the third person. Say, I'm not going to go Saudi again. No. I'm a desert. I don't know when I go come back. Really? I'm not saying that I'm happy that it happened, but well, is that what I'll be writing to somebody? Or a carry phone, say, I smack, I tell you, I'm not going to go again, but I did that. I said, I did for prison. It doesn't make sense. But God does not operate by sense. Sense would have said, go collect visa, find money, buy your ticket, go to Saudi. No, in fact, I tried sense. I knew that me and Saudi get business. I knew it. I knew it beyond every reasonable doubt that I had business with Saudi Arabia. Maybe it will still come in front. I don't know that part. That time in 1996, I believed with all my heart that is me and Saudi Arabia now. I was going to establish Jesus House Mecca. I'm Mecca to be Saudi Arabia. <laughs> I was going to, that was my mission, Jesus House, Mecca. That could be the name of the church. That was what I was going to do in Saudi. But I realized the easiest way to go to Saudi was to get a job as a doctor. So I went to the embassy, and they pointed me as their consultant in Ikoi, where they help people get Saudi job. I went to the guy's house, met him, we talked, he said, I should go and bring my CV, all that, blah, 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 blah. blah. I was going through the route that makes sense to human beings, get a job. I went to the embassy, I saw the ambassador, young boy, like 28. I told him my mission. He called somebody and handed me over to the person to arrange me that visa. But that was not what God wanted to do. That's the way of sense. Now, some of us, we succeed in that way of sense. If we go to Saudi, nothing will happen. You may even set up the Jesus house and God will not be there. 
When he finally has mercy on you, he will tell you, time be never rich for this. I was planning to do this in 40 years. You too quick, come, go back to Nigeria. Now that will be difficult for you to, to come back because you are enjoying the doctor's salary. You can't agree to come back. And by the way, I met many Nigerians in the desert. I begged these two young boys, Igbo boys, young boys, 21, 22 ish. I begged them. I said, go back to Nigeria. What are you doing in the desert? Every morning you wake up, you chop Banku, Pandodia uh, uh, made from flour. You chop Banku with uh, uh, sand infested soup. Because the tomatoes there, now sand, sand is 70% sand, 30% tomatoes. So you are chopping the thing, you know, say that sand you just swallow. But because that swallow there your hand, you believe you are eating. Then we call it camel leg, not cow leg, camel leg. We cook camel leg. That's our meat. Arabs so they chop camel leg, so we go and get them. So these boys thought that this is life. Yeah? Once in a while, you gather enough money to be able to buy a bottle of Coke, but it's not Coca-Cola. Uh, they have a name, Gazoos. So I looked at these boys. At least I still had my wits about me. Yeah? My senses were still intact. I said, guys, come, go back to Nigeria. And they told me plainly, waiting we go tell them, say, we bring come. When we go tell them, say, we go. They were going to Europe and they got stuck in the desert. I met a lot of them. Young boys, young girls, who had become prostitutes. Anyway, this is the journey God is calling Abraham to start. Come out from your country to a land that I will show you. As we now know, that same desert road is the road that Abraham passed. Because the story of the, the, the physical story of this, this commandment is desert road. It's desert road. Walking in the wilderness. All right. So I said, we must appreciate as early as possible that the business of the kingdom, the business of walking with God, you are going to encounter many situations that don't make sense. But you will have to take it, that's so it be. The foolishness of God, yes, sorry, the, uh, the wisdom of God is foolishness to men. Just as the wisdom of men is foolishness to God. So you can't come near God with your own smartness. He's going to tell you to get out of his sight. You are talking rubbish. He wants you to operate his own wisdom. You can't go to the wisdom of God to men. They are going to tell you to get out of here. You are talking rubbish. They want you to operate the wisdom of men. The wisdom that makes sense to the brain. Now, men understand this foolish wisdom. It's just that for some reason, we refuse to work with it. With all the stories we have heard, the two brothers who, who invented the airplane, the first time they told human beings that men will fly, they laughed at them. 1904, 1905. They laughed at these two brothers when they said men will fly. They said, oh, get out of here, what are you talking? You know what, you don't turn to bed. How are you going to fly? But they were busy walking at the how. And then one day, their how left the ground. Left the ground, you don't fly. Today, you have fighter jets. Nobody can know what they, oh, I, I was watching some, some of them on Facebook, Facebook no, YouTube. What those two brothers started. I saw a video yesterday of a fighter plane. Yes, it has to be. It cannot be anything else. The fighter plane came like this and stopped. It's in the air. He stopped and did a U-turn. He stopped. He do U-turn. As if he missed where the one bomb. He do U-turn. He went back there dropping bombs. When he stopped to do the U-turn, it's as if uh, what's that thing that they take flight come down? Parachute. As he stopped and did that U-turn, it's as if he released the parachute to help her hold the brake. And he turned. P aeroplane! Not that he got turned for Benin, come, come back to Lagos. That's the normal one. Not that. He got to this building. He realized it not be this building. He turned. Went back to number 16. Because Nadia is supposed to burn. When those two brothers started that talk, how many years ago now? 
100 the 1000 100 years ago people laughed at them people laughed at them when you go first come our village and they told us take cloth put on top of bucket that's your river water pour it through the cloth to another bucket it will be better to drink that water than the one you are drinking from the river it didn't make sense until you pour that water through your cloth and you see what the cloth holds back from the water. That's the, one of the simplest ways of purifying water. It's not perfect like boiling, but at least many of those things will be cut by the cloth. Our ancestors must also have laughed. Say, who built this one? This water we've done the drink since. They will forget that five of their children who died just after they begin drinking normal water, they won't know that that is the water that killed them because modern science had not reached there in Nigeria. But we have stories upon stories of inventions. When the inventor first said it, it will sound stupid. Electricity today, eh? Te-kinology. You know the meaning of that? Te-kinology. Press arm, make light go far. At the push of a button, you can do something far away from you just because you click. Today, I click. Just because you clicked on something. But when the people first said it, it would, oh, we all have phones now, have we? Just how many years ago, 40 years ago, to get, is it, no, 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 it's 40, okay. To phone America, we will go line up for VI, for business center. That one too far. This house, 2002, 22 years ago, I was using Nitec phone to do internet and to do email. You will press send for your email. <laughs> this house, you will press send with Nitel phone. The thing go the roll. You will be looking at it. Five minutes, ten minutes, twenty minutes. You will leave and go chop. By the time you come back, maybe you go down send. Many times I had to go to Nitel office. May they help me increase the speed of my own. I think finally somebody helped me to do something there. Today. We take it for granted. You just have to say, Phew, it's too late, you can't record, you don't go. <laughs> you don't go. <clears throat> now I can lie down on my bed and be talking to somebody in Japan. Which phone you want to lie down for bed 30 years ago to be talking to Japan? Technology. But at the beginning, it sounded like foolishness. Men have done those. That's not God now. That's just at the level of men. So imagine when then God, Jehovah God, says to Abraham's, Abraham and his wife, you go born Pekin. Can we blame the man for not believing? After 75 years, I've got very days since, you go born Pekin. You are going to have a child, two of you. It's because they did not believe, that's why they used the house girl. And for the next 13 years, God stopped talking to the man. As if to say, if that's how you are going to behave, we will have to review this our, our relationship. When I tell you something, you believe me. That's the game. And the next time he spoke to the man in Genesis 17 or so, he tells no, 15, he tells the man, walk before me blameless. Don't do that again. By that time the child was 13. One year later, they born Isaac. I tell you, say your wife go born, you go try for corner. I didn't tell you the house girl. I said, you are your wife. Now, I'm going somewhere with all of this. So just bear with me. He says to Abraham, come and walk with me by faith. Leave what you know onto a journey that you cannot even explain. That's foolishness, madness, but it requires faith to participate in it. Now they are calling Abraham what? You see, that time, that day, the whole world would have called Abraham what? Father of foolishness. Now, the Bible records him as father of all them that believe. Which means he's the father of the Noah said, and the Enoch. Even though those ones also were no, well, they came after him actually. Okay. I mean, no. Is in fact all them that believe, he says. 
All right, now let's let's move it forward. I was just trying to reestablish the four points we already made. One, the work with God is going to be characterized by many foolish moves, seemingly foolish moves, until you see the result. Two, it's going to be by faith. Three, it's not by sight. Four, when God is operating, he is operating from the dimension of his kingdom. And his kingdom is not a physical kingdom. So it will not be based on something that you can see. Now we have established all those ground rules. Let's move forward. How does it affect us in the now? Born again Christian. Colossians chapter 1, I think verse 3 or so, it says, Colossians 1, verse 13. Colossians 1, 13. Let's take it from verse 12. It says, giving thanks unto the Father, which had made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints, in light giving thanks unto the father which had made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light who had delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son i like the word used there translation God was in the process of translating Abraham from where he was to the new arrangement when he spoke to him, come out, come out, come out, follow me. He was changing his location and therefore experience. In the business of Christianity, the Bible says we have been translated. You are not going to be. You have been translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light in the Son of God. Case closed. Now what that means for the Christian, there is a kingdom of darkness and there is a kingdom of light. All our ancestors in Africa, they know the kingdom of darkness or they know about the kingdom of darkness. Now we went to go school, they argue about kingdom of darkness today. Because it does not make sense. We cannot handle it with our scientific minds. The kingdom of darkness. But let me, for the sake of explaining, give an example of the power of that kingdom. A certain gentleman, in 1990, no, 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 in 1982, was the secretary of one of the cults in Unilever. And with this I'm going to tell the story. He was the secretary of one of the cults in the University of Lagos. And between this gentleman and three of his friends, so four of them, they beat up a student. They beat up this student. They beat him. And the matter became a police case. And so police came, arrested these four students, charged them to court. They got bailed, and then the court case started. On the day that the victim was going to give, uh, was going to be led in evidence, or however they say it, just as that, as that day was approaching, the people involved understood that that day the victim would identify the people who beat him. So, one of them. The one that I said is, is, was the secretary of that court. One of them, his mother, sent for him from the village. My son, come home. So he went home. As we say in our local palace, they go back home. They did for him what needed to be done. You see, I'm telling the story with, um, what's the word? Is it passion or conviction? Because I know the person personally. I know the mama personally. They are personal people to me. I was in both their lives when this thing happened. So he went home. And they did whatever they did. 
He came back. On the court day, on the court day, the victim, the doc, the victim, that is, they want to ask him a question. So they asked him, uh, Mr. Victim, the people who beat you, are they in court? Can you see the people who beat you in court? He said yes, and he identified the other three guys. And this one, this particular one, you don't even look that side. So the court people then asked him, are you sure that's all? He said yes. So they now asked him about the fourth guy. What about this guy? And he looked at the guy and he said, I don't know this man, I've never seen him in my life. <laughs> <laughs> He said, I've never seen him in my life. I don't know him. That is how that guy got discharged and acquitted. He was to graduate from law later in his life. And when he got to Nigerian law school, he brought his Nigerian law school form to me as his guarantor. And I saw the question, have you ever been charged to court for a criminal case? He said, yes. Have you, what, what was the result? Have you ever been convicted of a criminal offense? He said, no. So they told him, give us a certified true copy of the court judgment. I took the court judgment to do that CTC and then to make a copy and attach to his form to go to Victoria and to help him submit it because I was his guard. I was the one paying his school fees. So I know this story. This is not uh, one man of God was casting out demons. So, eh, 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 not that one. This is a real human being known to me. We are talking about the, not the kingdom now, the power of darkness. The fellow, now those other three, one of them was a law student at that time. He's still around today, he should be like 64, 65 years old. He cannot practice law because Nigerian law school refused to give him admission because the convicted criminal. They paid the fine, nobody went to court, to jail. They paid the fine, it's a fine or one year jail time. They paid the fine and they went home. But that fourth man no pay any fine because he was acquitted. The person with the beat they never see him before. Lie! Something blocking eyes. Now, are we therefore now glorifying that kingdom? No. Okay, inside the Bible, Acts chapter 19, a, a, a young girl is running after Paul and his fellow preachers and she's saying these are the true men of God who have come to tell you of the way to the kingdom of God that is what she's saying that statement alone is the preaching of the gospel so she's literally preaching the gospel even though she's not talking about the death of Jesus and all that but she's literally preaching the gospel she's pointing at people preaching the gospel but the Bible says she was operating by a spirit of divination not the spirit of God. Oh, what about Simon, Simon of the senior? In Acts chapter 8, he bewitched an entire city. Think about it. Eh? Let's just take small Ikeja here. You bewitch the whole of Ikeja. Eh? And they are calling him great man of God. So anything he says, they are going to do. Until Philip came with the real power. And then even the Simon come bow. Simon could have given me small for this power, make an example of you. Because he saw something that he didn't understand. Now the Bible says we have been translated from the power of darkness to the kingdom, the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light in Jesus. We have been translated means you are no longer subject to that kingdom. The thing where they work for that kingdom can't work for your body again because you are no longer part of it. Why? Because you have been moved from there the day you became born again. You have been removed from there. That does not mean that they have shut down that kingdom. It's still there there. There are people who are still there. But as for the Christian, you have been removed from there into the kingdom that is in Jesus. That's what we just read. What that means is you can no longer operate like that. 
but you must now learn to operate as the kingdom of God operates. The kingdom of God operates by faith. The kingdom of God operates by the wisdom of God. The kingdom of darkness operates by sight. It operates by the wisdom of the world governed by Satan. Okay, let me give you an example of how the kingdom of darkness works. And then we can look through the Bible and see how the devil successfully used what I'm about to say to injure some people. Starting from Mama Eve. He says to Mama Eve, don't worry, if you chop this fruit, you will be like God. God does not want you to be like him. That's why he said don't chop the fruit. They are talking about a physical thing. And he's promising her, if you chop this fruit, you will be like God. In the kingdom of darkness, there is always a clear promise. Uh, is it promise? A clear result that is being offered. It's like a trade-off. You can see what you are going to get. You can, even if not something, you can't see being like God. You can't see that one. But you can conceptualize it. Eve knew what it was to be like God yeah. because she has been walking with him. Yes. He said you will be like God if you eat that fruit. Sometimes it will be, if you sow a seed of $1,000, you will get, you will reap a harvest. You know what I just did? I just entered as I have. Connie, Odoro. Satan always puts something in your front that you can recognize and makes it a promise if you do this thing that he's asking. So I beg you, every, every and any time moving forward, that something comes in front of you telling you if you do like this, you will get like this. Better go and check it. It's most likely not God. God may not tell you what the result will be. He will just tell you, less your tire. Very foolish. Why I go less my tire? And not be the car I want to go out. Less your tire, okay? Less your tire. I can't less my tire. He will spoil the rim if I drive on like that. Well, then he will keep quiet. You don't know why he's telling you to less your tire. So your obedience to God is not based on what you are going to get. That is where the devil gets us. He, he, uh, he, he dangles the carrot. Eh? And then he makes the, the, the offer. Many fall because they can understand the carrot that he's offering. They can, they, can, they can see that one. They can understand it. More painfully and more humanly, the lecturer says to the girl, if you sleep with me, I'll give you first class. Abi? Straightforward. Or he says to the boy, go and bring me $5,000 and you will get your papers complete. That's not God. God is not going to ask you for an offering before he blesses you. No, sir. What did you give him before he gave you Jesus? And in Jesus, he gave you everything. So don't come and be telling me God will do this if you do this. Just show me the commandment of God, at least the one in the book. I will go to one. Whatever God wants to produce as a result, let him produce that one as a result. See, let me say it again for the purpose of clarity. If, if, there, if the carrot, the result, is known, it's no longer fit. Abi? It's no longer fit. You are walking by sight. So that already negates the principle of the kingdom, walking by faith. Once you know what the result will be, you are no longer operating by faith. Oh Lord, help me get six A's in this my exam that I want to start tomorrow. Yes, boy. Wake up. Go and read ten chapters of the Bible. Ah, but Lord, I thought you'd be teaching me physics. I'm writing physics tomorrow. Shut up. Go and read ten chapters in Genesis for me. You see the foolishness? You see the foolishness? But our human understanding, that gentleman should be reading ten chapters of his uh, Nekon and Paka. Is that the book you still use? He should be reading ten chapters in Nekon and Paka. He's writing physics tomorrow. And God says to him, go and read 10 chapters in Genesis. Madness! I don't imagine there's any boy of that age who will go and read 10 chapters of Genesis. He will say, no, this one hard, this cannot. I'm not sure that I've read this topic. He will go and carry his text. God didn't say, if you read 10 chapters of Genesis 
I will give you your 10 A that you are looking for. He just said, go and read Genesis. At a time that you are expecting instruction from him about how to pass exam. So many times, we are the ones who construct the promise. He didn't say that. Go and read the Bible. Now he tell you. He not say if you read the Bible, you will get 10 A. There's no way reading the Bible is going to give you 10 A because the Bible is not a physics textbook, actually. But you know something? That examiner can be marking your paper and they go, go by mistake, drink Milo. Sleep will come the catch as he's marking your paper. Sleep will catch up. So where he's supposed to write bad, he goes, just, better the sweet time, I won't sleep. They'll compute everything, buzzer. I'm just using a simplistic example. But if you understand God, you know that his way is really foolishness to us. He can do something so ordinary, you will say, why didn't I see it like that before? I'm telling you, because I've seen WIAC examiners when they're marking, my papa was a WIAC examiner. Because I did there when he did mark scripts, I know that we could have changed any student's results if we knew what to do back in the day. Or if somebody can stretch some, some dollar that time, although that was like 1970 something. You just tell me your, your number, I look for it inside my father's paper, and exchange your script. Really? And nobody will know that that's how the boy got A in that course. I'm just giving an example. So why do you think God cannot prevail? I'm just giving an example. Why do you think God cannot similarly prevail on that lecturer? One way or another. You're not going to even know what they do when they mark your paper. Or, as you are writing the exam, this is even a better one. As you are writing the exam, God will just open your brain. You see the question, you will suddenly understand the question. You will just open in your brain, you open the part of the textbook or your notebook where the answer day. You just copy and put for them in your brain. Now, I've seen God do that one million times. Help me solve problems that my brain cannot by itself solve. I've seen God do that. But he wants you to walk with him. He said that I know all those your human problems. Don't worry about them. Is that not what is written in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25? What's a human problem? Your work. It's a human, is it a God problem? It's a human problem. I know all those your problems. Don't worry about problems. You come worry about what I said you should worry about. My kingdom and my righteousness. So when he tells you go read the Bible a day before your exam, it's going to sound foolish. But you enter that hall. You will be. <coughs> 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 I hope we, we get what I'm getting at. We have been moved from the kingdom of darkness, which means I am now living in Ghana. If it was when I was living in Lagos, you feel from your house, throw whatever you are throwing, you go reach my house, physically speaking. Now I live in Ghana. You cannot from your house in Nigeria throw to my house in Ghana what you used to throw that easily. Why? I don't pack. I have left that kingdom. So whatever used to operate in that kingdom, I am no longer subject to it. It can't work. But you see, because we are still afraid of what we know about that kingdom, we mistakenly open the door to that kingdom. Because we know I mean, you know, say oil. If you chop, take oil, chop yam with your hand. If you're not careful, there's no way you know will stain your cloth. We know already. So even if God is telling you use hand, chop that yam, you know we'll agree. Because you know what can happen. What if God wanted that oil to stain your shirt? Because he has told somebody who is in VI that when you get to that meeting, you will see a man with a red spot on his shirt. That's the person to deal with. You don't know that. So you use cutlery to chop the yam, your shirt is not stained. So the man comes from VI, God has told him, give the contract to the man that has a red stain on his shirt. The man comes to the meeting, he doesn't see any man with a red stain on his shirt. The oil was supposed to stain your shirt. The oil was supposed to stain your shirt. That was the plan. That was what we, we, the man will use to recognize you. He don't know you before. God has given him a sign, red spot on his shirt. Do you know how many times I've gone to the market? 
I don't get enough money, or I don't know exactly how to buy the correct, correct product, especially fridge. That was Holy Spirit, I beg you, you know all things, help me. Simple prayer. I will come down at Lawrence. There's one free session at the beginning of the fridge market. I'll come down there. I'm moving down the road. Out of the corner of my eye, I will see one guy wearing a red shirt. I'll look there. I'll flash the guy. In the shop, they'll be like, who get the, the same fridge? I'll flash the guy. You know, the first time this happened to me, I trekked the whole of Lawrence. The inside, on both sides, I'm looking for fridge. I know see fridge where I like. And then finally, around 5 p.m., I came to the road. I saw that guy with the red shirt. I now went to him. And he just retreated into his shop. The shop be like warehouse. <laughs> oh, God. You see, I was walking by sight. I just looked. You know, I don't see any fridge near the guy. I said, my dad, I know the same fridge. I moved. He just, as he saw me coming, he just takes back, enter inside his shop. See? This deep freezer is one of them. I bought this deep freezer from home. We have been translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Now, if you don't understand how the kingdom of light is or works, that's a different matter. Go and find out. Be there for Bible. Ask other Christians. Find books which talk about the business of the kingdom and read. But the point is, you have been translated from there to here. Now, that's one scripture. First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. Verse 9. First Peter chapter 2. Verse 9. We are the chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. To show forth the praises of him who had called us out of darkness into Yeah, a new generation of Christians now. Did you see it's in that in that place? Most of these things are songs. The only all you need is for the Holy Ghost to give you inspiration. This is a verse of scripture that I just used as a song. I didn't start it, I learned it myself. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. And holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him. Now here's what it, here it starts. To show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That is what God has done. Now here's the foolishness again. Now here's another variant of the foolishness of the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God says God has done it. Not going to. He has done it. With your eye, you cannot see the how. Because enemies still abound. The man where they put, uh, the thing where they put for junction, he still they put them for junction. Maybe it's targeted at you, self. you don't know. But it's still a dwarm. The fowl where they cry for night is still a dwarm. Every night I come out, I still see pussy cats jumping all over the place. If I once I step outside, you see one just fly out from under my car, cross the road as if if he come do something with my car, you just fly cross the road and all those. If you go to where it has been, you will see one maybe one black one. You just jump out of the dustbin, just take off across the road. But traditionally, with, with all those things mean they mean something to us. He says he has called. What does to call person mean? If you have been called, say somebody's calling you. If they come and say that is calling you, what's going to happen to you next? A change of your physical location may happen because you are going to answer that. He said he has called us out of darkness 
into his marvelous light. Something has changed about you. Forget it. It does not matter whether you can see it or whether you can perceive it. It is a done deal. That's what God said. Believe it. The problem with us is we either don't know these truths or we don't believe it. He said he has called you out of darkness. How can something that you are not part of affect you? So somebody will come go do juju now. He said they did juju against this pastor. How? Now, he said no weapon fashioned against you can prosper. That is your corresponding scripture. The weapon that is fashioned against you is coming from the kingdom of darkness. Eh? Because God will not inspire that weapon against you. Not his child. He can't send his child to come and fight you, his child. No way. Instead, he will send you to offer He said, no weapon fashioned against you can prosper. He said, this is the heritage of the servants of God. Forget man of God level. You became a servant of God the day you obeyed the gospel. The one you choose to obey, you become his servant. The day you obeyed the gospel, you became a servant of God. Simple. This is the heritage of those people who obey God. Nothing can happen to them. That, he did not say that they're not going to try. He said no weapon fashioned. So the weapon will be fashioned. Eh? But it will not work against you. You will see 10,000 falling by your right hand and your left hand. People where the thing hit. But it cannot hit you because you are no longer of the system where that thing can hit. If you go back to that system, it will hit you because it is designed for that system. But because the weapons from the kingdom of light, they are more powerful, if you throw a weapon from light into darkness, darkness will scatter because this one is more powerful, really. He has translated us one. He has called us two. Now there's a third one. It's in Galatians chapter 4. He says that by a spirit of adoption, by a spirit of adoption, so we have been adopted. What does adopt mean? Originally it was not part of it. But by a certain decision made by a certain somebody, that thing or person has now become part of it. So you can say we adopt the motion if not meeting under the hold. Or you can adopt a child, which means not be you born now. You can adopt a community that every year you will spend 1% of your annual profit as a company. You will spend it in that community. Meaning that community is not your native community. That's not where you from come. You have adopted that community to do this with. 1% of your annual profit for your company, you will spend it in that place. You have adopted the community to do, what do they call that? Social uh, community service. Hands, corporate social responsibility. You have adopted them, just like you adopt a child. God has adopted us into his family. Then you go, they look, somebody who throw weapon, call him in Peking. God will be looking. But because we don't understand, we cannot have faith in what God has said. We don't understand how it works. Not that you must understand how God is going to do it. Eh? You don't understand what has happened. Yes, these basics. We don't realize what happened the day we said to Jesus, I do. We don't realize. So you still see yourself as a, as a, a normal human being. You are not. And so you cannot live your life like a normal human being. You are not a normal human being. There is a life inside you which the normal human being does not have. The normal human being is still in the kingdom of darkness. So he is governed by the wisdom of this world. So if he wants to prosper in business, he must, um, he must go to Alausa and bribe all the government officials concerning that business. That's the wisdom of the world, really. I mean, how many people say that's the way it works? 
except for people like Mr. Henry, we don't agree. <laughs> that is the way it works. Okay, I give an example. Which day so? Today is Sunday. Around on Tuesday or so, I needed to buy food. I know the way it works. I got to the filling station around 6.30 or so. Everywhere don't fool. Area boys, regular boys, fool. I know I can't carry the car into the filling station. Let's no forget that one. No way. So I got I went there prepared with a big jerry can. I left it in the car. I went inside the filling station. And I went to meet the attendant. Everybody's watching me. I know they are going to respect my white baby. I went to the attendant. I said, Mr. Attendant, I'll pay you extra if you answer me now. Now. He said, where's your car? I said, no, not car, jerry car. He said, go and bring your jerry car. He said, go and bring your jerry car. I went to bring my jerry car. He answered like three, four people. Small, small, four, four liter jerry car. He answered them. Maybe to get them out of the way so I can put my jerry car there because it's big. He said, so he said, okay, how much? I said, fill up. He fill up. As he's filling up, he said, okay, I got 1,000. I actually had 2,000. I actually had 2,000 in my hand. He said, what? So that he cheated himself. He said, I was going to. I just hold the money for if he said to that, I would have given him. You know why? It is more important to me to save my time at 6.30. If I be MD, will I be in the filling station by 6.30 and you stay there till 12 noon? You stay there till 12 noon? Because of 1,000 Naira? Nonsense. Take your 1,000 Naira. I carry my jerry can. Come up there. Come back home. Now I can start the day. I don't do this one, don't come off a road. But if you don't understand, you will go and stay in that queue. And by 12 noon, they will tell you, say, for I don't finish. Which means you just wasted that time. <coughs> we have been translated from one kingdom to another. We have got to be clear about that. We are no longer part of that system. Now what that automatically means, like I said already, you cannot live like them. So you go to Ghana. You are a Nigerian, yes. So you are posted to Ghana. And you insist that you want to eat uh, powdered jam and a goosey soup because you are in Nigeria. You will get to the booker and you will ask for powdered jam and a goosey soup because now your Nigerian thinking things are your head. And they will tell you that what they have is kenke, not powdered jam, kenke and whatever the name of their soup be. For me, I can never eat swallow inside Ghana territory. Not because I the quarrel with anybody, but because in my Nigerian mentality, the two get to their different plates. They put the food inside this plate and they pour the soup on top of it. And that's how they, uh, you see the difference? That's how they enjoy it. If you serve me food like that, now you go chop out. I want my food nice and neat. So my hand will be clean as I'm eating. Not, I will be struggling. But that is their cultural way of serving the food. I know Sabi chop like that. You see the difference. So you get there and you say you want for the German and goosey, and they tell you they know they sell that kind of thing. What's going to happen to you after a while? You are going to switch to the system in Ghana. If they, they do left hand drive in Ghana, and they do right hand drive in Nigeria. You cannot insist that because you are a Nigerian, you are going to drive the Nigerian way in Ghana. You will switch to the way they drive over there. So back in the day, back in the day when I was still playing the boy, I got me some contraband at their wharf. <coughs> Knowing the Nigerian way, you settle. The port official caught me with the contraband. Not drugs, it was actually fish, tuna fish. He caught me with it and he asked me what's inside your bag. I said fish. 
He said, don't come back here. Yes, sir. I went to my ship, I dropped my fish, I came right back, bought another set. It's contraband. You are not, ordinary civilian should not handle that fish. It's government property, just like our crude oil. Government property. I came back, big, big fish, big like my leg. Dense meat. I came back, bought another set. The man caught me again. But this time, I had a big bottle of Coke in my hand for the Nigerian formula. And if I see the man again, I'll give him the Coke, I'll give him a packet of cigarettes. As what? Right. I learned a big lesson that night. And to the praise of those people, I must put this on air. The man arrested me. I offered him what I had to offer him. He arrested me. Without even looking in my direction, he brought out his walkie-talkie and called the supervisor. And the supervisor came, almost within five minutes, he came with a van. And they collected me and my fish and took me to their holding point. Arrested. Arrested. In my country, we know what will happen. You will go with your fish. Minus the coke and uh, whatever else you have to offer. I learned a lesson that night, not about bribe, but that there are people who are ready to operate by the rule of law. He said, no, I'm not taking it. He called his supervisor to come and carry me and arrest me. He seized the fish, told me to go to my ship and sleep. He said, because you're a foreigner, that's why you will not spend one year in jail, because you're a foreigner. So that's two kingdoms, Ghana, Nigeria. Two different kingdoms. I was trying to operate the system in Nigeria, in Ghana, and they let me know it doesn't work here. That's 1990, I don't know about today. It doesn't work here. And they arrested me, seized my fish, seized my ID card, told me, come back in the morning, come and see the port captain, and explain to him what you are doing with our fish. If you try to operate in the kingdom with the way of the world, it will not work. It will not produce the results of the kingdom. So you have got to discover the ways of the kingdom. How does the kingdom work? And I'm going to close with this. How does the kingdom work? The kingdom of God, that is. How does the kingdom of God work? The kingdom of God operates not just by faith. The kingdom, there cannot be faith apart from what I'm about to say. The kingdom of God operates on the basis of the word of the king. Just like any other kingdom, it operates on the basis of the word of God. The kingdom of God operates on the basis of what God has said. The kingdom of God works according to the word of God. So you have got to discover what the word says on a particular matter and just fall in line with what the word says and you will get the benefit that is in the kingdom concerning that matter. Simple. Simple. But the problem is, we are coming from a system where you have to do something to get a result. In the system of the kingdom of God, God has already done it. And he offers it to you as a gift because you are his child. Is called grace. You have got to discover from his word what he has already made available so that you can claim it by faith. So where there is no word, there cannot be faith. Faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. So although we said at the beginning that walking with God is by faith, you cannot walk with God except he's talking or he's showing you something. That you can now believe to follow. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. How are you going to work with God if you don't know the shirt, the color of shirt that he's wearing? You see, to you, that's the word. Follow yellow shirt. Eh? You are working with God, you know the color of his shirt. So you just follow yellow shirt. Well, too bad for you, there are not 10 people wearing yellow shirt. Then you have to follow something else. But if he's the only one wearing yellow shirt, then it's easy for you to follow. So he says, follow me. So it means before you make any step, you've got to find out from him what next. Turn left, turn right, stand where you are, go to sleep, drink water, eat, 
whatever. You have to know from him what next. That's why the Bible says, those that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of the kingdom. They are the true operators of the kingdom, those that are led by the Spirit of God. Because if you are following the Spirit of God, you are following the Word of God. Because the Spirit of God will only speak the Word of God. The kingdom operates according to the Word of God. I will give one example of what I'm saying. You can go and discover, and there are plenty. Every aspect of life, there is a word of God governing it. <coughs> but I'm going to give just one example. In our natural life, in this world we determine who is rich based on what is inside his bank Abi? something like that or his displayed capacity there may be no money in the bank but you can see his warehouse is full of goods there may be no money in his bank but you see his warehouse full of goods which means once he sells those goods there will be money in the bank or you may see that he has built a very wonderful house in Banana Island. That's not for small boys. The point is, in this world, a rich person is defined by something that we can see. Something that we can appreciate. Something we can measure. Okay. This is what the word of God says with reference to the kingdom. Second Corinthians chapter 8 verse 9 or so, he says... We know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ in that although he was rich, he became poor so that through him we might be made rich. Am I quoting correctly? 2 Corinthians 8 9. Eh? For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ in that although he was rich, he became poor so that we might be made rich in other words in jesus we have been made rich case closed i will never be poor again you know why i'm part of the kingdom of god in the kingdom all his children are rich because jesus has made it so how i'll give you just two or three scriptures Matthew eleven twenty seven. Jesus said, My Father in heaven has put everything in my hands. What's everything? The things by which we define who is rich. He has put everything in my hands. Now I'm inside Jesus. So that hand is now my own. So I already have it when as yet there's nothing to show. You see the problem between the two, the two, the two kingdoms? One kingdom has to see it to believe. The other kingdom believes it before it is physically manifest. The children of the kingdom have already been made rich because of Jesus. The second scripture I said I wanted to show, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, he says, everything you need for life and godliness has already been supplied in Christ. Now, please, 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 um, Mr. Ifa, you understand this better than the rest of us. He's a businessman. He's a businessman of warehouse type of talk. So imagine that your warehouse is full. Eh? Will you be going up and down calling yourself a poor man? No. You know that all you need. Say something. The Bible says, the word of God says that our warehouse is full. What's our warehouse? Jesus. He said everything we need has already been put in the warehouse. All we've got to do is believe so. Jesus said, don't worry about your need. Your father knows that you have that need. He will supply. That's Matthew 6.25. Now in 2 Peter 1, the Bible says he has supplied. So if you are in your house 
and your worker comes and says to you, oh God, we don't load finish, where are soon? We used to be worrying about how it will be tomorrow. You have been told that the warehouse is full. We have been told that the warehouse is full. Everything we need to do our business on earth has been supplied. It's in the warehouse. Now, you may not know the road to the warehouse. That's why I said, if you don't understand, seek to understand. But first of all, let us be clear about the provisions of the kingdom that we have been called to. In this kingdom, it is not your business to provide for yourself. The head of the kingdom, God, has already made provision for you. But it is, it was what? It is, it is appropriated by faith. He said, I have supply. Yes, sir, I believe you. So you stop worrying about how it could be. And then you worry about whatever he's telling you to do. When you get to the point of supply, that supply will happen. One way or another. He said he has supplied. That supply will get to you one way or another. But we don't know these things. So what do we do? We preach faith without works is dead. Meaning, you have to do something to get something. And so we start to encourage people, oh, you must do something. Uh, uh, heaven helps those who help themselves. Show me that in the Bible. He has already supplied everything we need for life and for godliness. The problem for some of us is we are looking for something that we don't necessarily need. So you put your children, for example, in Corona school, where they are paying two million per term. Did God send you there? If not, why will he provide for you there? But if he sends you there, relax. It will happen. Because he said so. You are taken care of. Our business is to follow the way of the king. Follow the spirit. Follow his wisdom. Follow his word. The kingdom is structured by the word of God. So if you are a Christian and you want to you want to prosper in the kingdom, then you've got to go after the word of God. Simple. You've got to follow the word. And in a case where you don't understand, then you've got to seek a clarification so you can understand. Because everything is based on the kingdom, on, on the word. Everything is based on the word of God. You've got to know that from the beginning. Everything about your born again status is based on the word of God. You were saved by grace through faith according to the word of God. You will grow according to the word that you receive. And you will come into the inheritance according to his word. Everything is based on the word. 